This call is now being recorded. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I just want to read a psalm and then bring it back. I just want to read from Psalm 111. It says, it says this, Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. Lord is gracious, full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his power. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So this psalm talks about... Uh, oh, is it? You know, Check, check, how's it loud? Is it loud enough? Um, yes, Pastor. It was just muffled, like breaking up. Oh, is it? Now, now, now is it okay? Little bit of echo is there. I'm not echo sure. Is there. Yeah. Okay, just one second. Uh, How's it now? Oh, much better, Pastor. Yeah, I think um, I just it was coming through the webcam. Now it's through the mic. Okay, sorry, my bad. No yeah, Okay. Okay. So uh, Psalm 111 talks about um, you know the the um, the psalmist is actually declaring that he will praise the Lord with his whole heart and all that, right? So it talks about the works of the Lord and describes how his works are great and how they are studied by all who have pleasure in them, right? His work is honorable, his works are studied, and he has made his wonderful works to be remembered. And one way in which we remember the works of God is when we when we bring it back to him, right? When we testify to him, when we lift up his name and say, God, this these are your works, this is who you are. Right? And typically we do that uh, when we come before him in worship, when we come before him in praise, and we say, Lord, these are your attributes. This is what you have done, and this is what you promise that you will do. So his works are great. His works are studied by all who are upright in heart and who have pleasure in them. And he has made his wonderful works so that they can be remembered, right? And they point back to him. So can we can bring it back to him as a testimony and as an act of worship to God, right? Okay. So why don't we just pray and um, just think about you know, as we start, think about uh, the work of the Lord. You know, it could be your own life and say, Lord, I am who I am because of what you've done. Right? The work of the Lord. What has he done in your heart that you want to testify you know, to the assembly and in the congregation where you can say, you know, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly. You know, what is it that you have experienced recently? Or, you know, what is it that you have uh, it need not be recent as well, but then what is it that stands out in your heart, in your mind, uh, what he has done that you know, that is causing you to testify, right? Um, just think about it for a minute. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, let's just pray and thank the Lord. Father God, we thank you. I want to thank you for your grace, Lord. I've experienced your grace immeasurably, Father God. Every day, every moment, Lord, your grace, Lord, realize that we are not, Lord, we don't qualify, but then, Lord, you made us, Lord, worthy of your grace. And we thank you for your grace this morning. We thank you that your grace enables us even today. We thank you that your grace, Lord, transforms us even today, God. And uh, 
Lord, we bring it back to you, God. We turn around and say, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your works. Lord, your work in our lives, your work in our, Lord, everything around us. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name, Father God. We thank you that you do it so that, Lord, we can study that, Lord. We, we thank you that we can do it, oh God. We can take pleasure in them, God. They are works of righteousness, God. And we thank you, Lord. You do these works in our lives and around us so that, Lord, we can Lord, bring it back to you, Father God. Yes, Master, that we can remember them, Lord. Lord, even as time goes by, Lord, even as we journey through life, we can always remember them, Father God, and give you praise. And so we do that this morning. We thank you. We bless your name. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so uh, this course is a worship ministry, right? And uh, it's... Uh, uh, it's an add-on or a continuation, I would say, of uh, you know, something we saw, uh, we have learned in uh, in the first semester, right? Um, in uh, praise and worship class, we looked at it. We looked at uh, certain aspects of it, but this is, uh, you know, this is a, you know, specifically we looked at certain aspects of, you know, worship, and maybe a deeper aspect of worship. And also, we, uh, you know, we also study, okay, um, what is happening in worship, in, in, in terms of worship in the different churches, and specifically some of the, you know, learnings that we have had as a church, you know, as a ministry, and share that also. Um, so uh, we will also look at some of the administrative side of it, right? So, so these are some things which are practical, some common wisdom. So uh, what we can do and, uh, you know, what is it when, you know, the worship ministry grows and uh, typically every church, you know, is every every individual and every body of believers are involved in worship in different ways. And uh, we know that there is no one definition of, okay, this is how worship should be. But, uh, you know, except the fact that the Lord said that worship needs to be in spirit and truth. So it's a, you know, we are... We're given that freedom to be creative as long as it's in spirit and truth. Right? That it's not superficial, that it's not, you know, like uh, pretense or hypocritical. As long as it's deep, as long as it's a deep communion, as long as it's in truth, meaning as prescribed in scripture and without any pretense and you know, without any uh, hypocrisy. Right. So, so that's the thing. So th that is what we are going to uh, look at in this uh, in this course. So before we uh, go in, so I just want to ask us, you know, what do you remember of what we studied in praise and worship in the first semester? Maybe each one of you can share a few things, uh, or maybe just one thing that you remember about what you studied. What stands out to you in praise and worship? Worship is not a feeling. It doesn't depend on our feeling. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and the portion of worship, worship is not about us, but it's all about Him. Yes. But it involves us. Yeah. Yes. We, yeah. Mm. So it's uh, not just singing the songs, but it's also how you live your life every day. It's a lifestyle. Okay. Anything else? Online folks also, what do you remember, recall, about what we learned? Um, the posture of worship, especially how do, how do, what is the posture when we worship God? Yeah. Mm, what we can bring to the Lord. Yeah, okay. So what is it that we bring to the Lord? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So the Bible also talks about something that we bring, you know, uh, it talks about the sacrifice of praise, right? Out of a full heart, when we, uh, it says sacrifice of praise, which is a fruit of our lips, which means the, the words that we bring, you know, coming out of our heart, of course, uh, and the songs that we, you know, maybe it could be in song, it could be, a, you know, the, even that matters, right? The words that we bring. It, do, it does matter. Yes, it's also lifestyle. It's also about our life. But then, when we verbally, um, you know, announce it, proclaim it, uh, that is 
you know that is praise the fruit of our lips okay so uh, chaya says every work we do we remember god and do for him in daily life yes okay so anything about prophetic worship tabernacle we looked at a lot of other things also right for semester difference between praise and worship any hebrew words you remember hmm all are all you remember <laughs> okay okay but this is what uh, stands out i guess okay so let's look at um, kadash okay kadesh but, but is that uh, something to do with uh, praise and worship that we saw i know we we looked at ya yada toda halal zamar na uh, shabak tahila I guess that's it, right? Huh? Yada toda, yes, right. Okay, right. Okay, so um, so let's uh, let's just move on. You know, the, the first chapter we're just going to look at, uh, you know, what is what we see as worship and what we see as worship ministry in the Word of God. Okay, so and specifically, we're just going to look at uh, you know the altars that Abraham built and. He built it as an act of worship to God, right? He he built it as an act of remembrance. He built it as an act of worship to God. Okay, so we go right to that uh, place in Scripture where God commands Abraham. Right? He commands Abraham to leave his land, to leave where he, where he is living, and uh, the people with whom he is living, his relatives, and and his possessions, and everything, and he. Uh, to to move to a place to move to a land which he, god is showing right so in that journey we see that abraham actually builds builds sorry builds certain altars okay so um so what does an altar mean it is a elevated place where there is a there is a sacrifice right? there's something that is put that's something that is done well it need not always be a sacrifice but it's an it's an elevated place right and it's Uh, on that you put something or you do something uh, as an act of acknowledging god as an act of acknowledging that hey, you know uh, or giving unto god right so in his journey in his life abraham builds certain altars and every every altar that he builds is uh, you know has something around it he builds this in response to something or it denotes something signifies something so you know it's important i mean it's interesting for us to uh, for for us to study that okay so what what does this altar generally represent right in the bible when we read we see that it's a place of sacrifice right? it's a place where um, an animal or you know a, a living creature is sacrificed and it's a place the blood is shed it's a place of death right so yeah so it's a, it's a kind of a gruesome thing right uh, an altar we talk about it but then this is what it meant and it's symbolize something something very deep what does it symbolize it symbolized a, an acknowledgement of god it symbolized i'm doing this for you god i'm doing this to acknowledge that you are god i'm doing this and i'm giving this to you god right so uh, and a, a place of worship where god was acknowledged where god was remembered where it was it was done out of a you know place of thanksgiving uh, etc okay. initially we see that you know there were only burnt offerings that was that was given right burnt offerings which were given at the altar and then you know we see that uh, the law of moses was not yet given so then we see you know the law unfolding and we see certain specifications given etc you know you you do this sacrifice in order for for this etc right thanksgiving or peace and all that right so um so we see that these altars were not just exclusively for uh you know we could say you know the people of god well everyone right everyone who did not worship yahweh as god they also had altars or high places you know so it was it was a universal thing that uh, well they did it 
or a particular deity to acknowledge that um, uh, you know there was this power and they did something on it they gave something to acknowledge that but in scripture it was to acknowledge the one true god right on the altar it was it was to acknowledge that you know uh, i acknowledge meaning i recognize and i accept and and i say that you know this is who god is right so in the scripture we see that it was done in order to acknowledge this one true god this yahweh right another thing that we see is that when it comes to the altar it was a place of meeting it was a place of encounter it was a place of meeting it was a place of um communion right meaning uh, when you say communion it was a place of fellowship right it was a place of connect so unlike you know in the you know dispensation after the cross we see that yes um, god indwells us so we are able to just step in to that place of worship step into that place of communion with him you know effortlessly like because we are always invited the way is always open and we read that in hebrews right hebrews 4 um he has made a way for us to come to the holy of holies to come to the throne of grace um but it was not always so so we see that it was a place a physical place where a person could actually commune with god right that have a deep fellowship a deep conversation with god so it it symbolized something it it meant something for someone who is seeking god it meant a place of communion right and it was a place where it was not just one way where a person came and gave and and said okay you know and then went back but it was also a place where a person received right instructions from god this is what you must do and, and you know so or on behalf of some people there were instructions given and instructions received okay so let's look at the first altar when we read we are looking at altars of abraham like altars that abraham built okay so um we can turn to genesis 12 and you can follow on the notes as well genesis 12 okay so genesis 12 the lord gives instruction at the beginning we see the beginning the first few verses we say that uh, we see the lord um giving the instruction and also giving the promise and how he will bless and so on and then in verse 6 we see abram passed through the land to the place of shechem as far as the terebinth tree of mora more um, and the canaanites were there in the land then the lord appeared to abram and said to your descendants i will give this land and there he built an altar to the lord who had appeared to him okay. so god gives the instruction you leave god gives the promise and the, you know this is how i will bless you and so in obedience to it abram does that and he builds an altar so we can say that you know this was an altar which was built in obedience to god or immediately as he obeyed he built this altar we can call it an altar of obedience and and when we when we read hebrews 11 and verse 8 it talks about how abram by faith obeyed god right not knowing where he was going he he obeyed god right he took god at his word and he obeyed him and moved from that land so it was an altar which was built based on abraham's obedience and in fact his name was still called abram not changed to abraham so it was an altar of obedience it was a place which signified you know for abraham it meant okay i have obeyed my god he had given me this instruction it was uh, you know it, it involved certain effort because family and you know possessions and whatever it was and livestock and all that is just moving from there right it meant something so he builds this altar in this in this place and the bible very clearly you know describes where he did that it was uh, she came and terebin the tree and all that and and who were there in the land and and right there he builds this altar to the one true god yahweh and uh, he does this 
Right. So um, there he built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. So you see that communion happening. You see that he's calling on the name of the Lord. And there is this physical place which tells Abraham, you know, here I called on the name of the Lord. Here, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a place where I remember my obedience and he you know, called on the name of the Lord. Okay. Then when, he, when we uh, go further, we see that... Uh, um, that he moves from that place to the to the mountain of uh, uh, Be uh, to the mountain um, uh, east of Bethel and so on. So we read that. So he goes there, and there also he built another altar. Right? He builds another altar. He, he goes from Egypt. Uh, I'm sorry, from Egypt to the south, and and then he went back to Bethel, and, and he stays in this place, and uh, and then. He builds this altar. So, so the second altar refers to his intimacy with God, right? He um, is his intimacy with the Lord, and his, um, uh, which means his walk with the Lord, the closeness of his walk with the Lord, right? Um, and uh, and we see that uh, Abraham, it's a it's a place where it's a place of walk with him. It's a place that shows him that yes i've continued to obey i've continued to walk with the lord and it is not a one time thing but he's growing in in the lord he's getting to acknowledge getting to know the lord getting to know who god is his characteristics his abilities and uh, and then you know it it says that uh, uh, in uh, hebrews 11 and verse 9 you know, and when he reached the land, God promised him he lived there by faith. He reached the land where God promised him and he lived there, which means he continued to live there, not disconnected from God, but connected to him because he lived by faith. Okay, not only in journeying to the land, but in the land, he continued to live by faith in God. Right. So it says that, okay, he received the promise, but he didn't stop there. Right. His walk with God, his intimacy with the Lord continued. So he builds that. So it again, you know, it uh, uh, it it shows that he continued, and this altar continued his walk with God, and this altar signified his intimacy with God. Right. Um, okay. So um, the third one that we see. Okay. He goes to this place called Hebron, okay, and he builds the altar there. Okay, uh, let's um, um, just trying to get the reference. Okay, so um, uh, he uh, look. I think we can look at uh, chapter thirteen and verse three. Right, thirteen and three and verse four. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar which he had made there and first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Okay, So he comes to this place and again calls on the name of the Lord. Um, we see what happened before that. He goes to Egypt, and that whole incident about the Pharaoh, and uh, you know, he actually lies to the Pharaoh, and uh, and you know, he uh, uh, the Pharaoh uh, finds that out and sends him back, and all that. So um, it was it was it was not a very easy thing. It was not a very comfortable thing. It was something uh, of a discomfort which happened there. And it was something that brought out, you know, again, renewed his commitment to the Lord, right? So, uh, so there we see that he built this altar um, to the Lord, right? Now, this place, um, if you go to verse 18, okay, um, Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trims, uh, trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. So this place, 
uh, this word mamre uh, apparently means manliness and hebron means society of friendship and so on right uh, or strength so when abraham abraham moves there so he is actually separating himself you know if you read he, he decides to separate himself uh, from lot separate himself from sodom and gomorrah that's what we read in chapter 13 right uh, Uh, verse twelve. If you see chapter thirteen, verse twelve, Abraham Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So he actually separated himself from from the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. He separated himself. So we can say that this was an altar of you know of consecration. It says that again, he he built an altar and he communed with the Lord. Right? He lived as a pilgrim. he separated himself uh, and he lived in communion with god you know I'm not trying to read too much into it but then this is what he did you know he his physical act his physical journey represented what he did and so we can say that when he when he came and built the altar to the lord it was you know to to signify that he had separated himself consecrated himself uh, from what was happening there you know what we can call as the world right the fourth altar that we see uh, we go to genesis 22 okay, and verse 9 genesis 22 and verse verse 9 it says then they came to the place of which god had told them and abraham by you know by now god changed his name so abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order and he bound and he bound isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood okay so so we see we we know what happened before that right god gives him the instruction that he needs to sacrifice his son and uh, abraham obeys and it was an altar where he he literally he was about to sacrifice his son so we can say this was an altar of sacrifice right um so it says that uh hebrews 11 says by faith hebrews 11 verse 17 by faith abraham offered isaac as a sacrifice when god was testing him abraham who had received god's promises was ready to sacrifice his only son isaac even though god had told him isaac is the son through whom your descendants would be counted abraham reasoned that if isaac died god was able to bring him back to life again and in a sense the bible says abraham did receive his son back from the dead right so so we see this this is an altar of sacrifice so first one we see that an altar of obedience second one we see an altar of intimacy where he is continuing with his walk to the lord third one we see an altar of uh, you know an altar of separation or, or consecration right from the world and then we see that fourth one that he builds an altar of sacrifice right so so we see that um, you know we see abraham building this so every time he is actually it's a picture of worship and different aspects of worship right he's he's worshiping god he's communing with god and uh, and this is how he he did it he built this altar but it it also brings out certain aspects of worship for example obedience and right. we know that you know without obedience you know you it cannot be it, it can be you know very empty and futile if you say i'm worshiping god right obedience is a big part of it when we in fact the lord jesus himself said you know if you love me obey my commandments so in worship we 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 love god we adore god and we are commanded to love him with all our heart mind and soul and strength But the Lord says, you know, if you love me, obey my commandments, right? So, in worship, obedience is a big part of it, right? And and Abraham, when in obedience, and as he built that altar, he it kind of signifies that, right? And second one, we see that life of intimacy, right? He continued on with the Lord, and with a walk with the Lord. It, his walk with the lord his relationship with the lord his communion with the lord did not stop so again pointing back to worship that worship is a walk of 
intimacy. Like, it's not a moment. It's not an event. Um, it's not. It does not stop at a particular moment. It, but it's it's a continued walk of intimacy. It's a life of intimacy with the Lord. And thirdly, we read about that third altar where he has distanced himself, distanced himself uh, from the world. He separated himself, consecrated himself. Uh, we can say he consecrated himself, you know, from all that was worldly and all that was sinful. And he builds the altar again, pointing to the fact that we can worship God or we are called to worship God in the beauty of his holiness, right? In separation, in consecration. Right? And lastly, we see that that altar uh, that where there is sacrifice, right? Sacrifice is something that we give up. Sacrifice is something that we even... We, I mean, sorry, we give up willingly. And sacrifice is something that we also take on, right? It could be, uh, you know, maybe a responsibility, maybe something that we need to do. But that is also a sacrifice because it involves giving up of a certain things in order to take on, right? So, um, so we see that, yes, he was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to give up something that was even very, very dear to him, right? And so also when we look at Hebrews chapter 13, um, let's just read that verse. Right? We look at Hebrews um, Hebrews 13 and um, you know verse 15 says, therefore by him let us continually offer, and it says the sacrifice of Praise to God. Okay, again that word sacrifice. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Okay, you see that giving thanks to His name, which is something that you know that we can do out of our heart. It is seen as a sacrifice of praise. Okay, which means. You know, even when, when the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times, right? I will. It's Sometimes it is a decision. It is a choice. We don't feel it, but we do that. It could be in a very difficult season of our lives, right? But it involves a sacrifice. Right? During that difficult season, to bring that fruit of our lips, which is giving thanks to God, it involves a sacrifice. It involved. It, it could be a difficult moment, right? Uh, just like you know, Abraham for Abraham, it was a difficult moment, right? But we see he still built that altar, right? He still built that altar. So, um, so it's it's something that inspires us, right? It's something that that really motivates us. Okay, I know sometimes we make it out to be an event. It is not. Sometimes we make worship to be uh, you know, something that happens when everything is going fine. You see, it is not. Right? It is even as we see in, uh, in, in, in the Word of God, in, in the book of Acts, it's Paul and Silas in Philippi, in prison, uh, bringing that sacrifice of praise to God, right? that thanksgiving to Him. Uh, in that prison, it says, at midnight, they were singing hymns to God. Right? So we see that, yes, there is that aspect of sacrifice, sacrifice which is involved in worship, which is involved in singing those songs or bringing praise to God. Right? And physically, Abraham actually did that right there on the altar. Okay? So, so, the, so in his journey, when he builds these altars, these four altars that we look at, it's, it's actually a type, it's actually symbolic of what happens in worship, right? what we bring to him. It... Well, it it would involve this, right? So we don't have to be surprised that, hey, this is taking a lot more out of me, you know. And uh, my simple expression of praise, well, it's pulling a lot out of me. It is, it is taking, you know, it is uh, in terms of sacrifice, in terms of consecration, it's 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 a lot more than just, you know, just raising of hands or, or yes, it involves that, but it's a lot more than that, right? Okay. 
Okay, now let's move on to uh, to look at a little bit about you know in the Old Testament, you know, how, or you know in the Bible. We'll also look at in the New Testament times, but where we see that in the Old Testament, you know, how did people worship God? Because we read about these altars. How did people actually connect with God? Right? How did they come to a place, and um, what are the specific instructions and everything that we see? Right? So, in the Bible, the, uh, any idea where God says, "Okay, this is how you need to meet with me," or "This is how you need to do it"? No, in the Old Testament. Yeah. Okay. So, um, one thing that that you know that is very apparent uh, let me just check uh, um, that is very uh, you know uh, descriptive to the minute details that we see is uh, uh, is in the in the tabernacle right for an entire community of people where god is saying okay uh, you do this this and it's a, it's a journey right from the out sorry yeah right uh, the the tabernacle, right? So uh, we see those a um, uh, lot of specifications about how it should be, a lot of specifications about what should be done in what part of um, the tabernacle, and so on, right? Um, when we look at um, uh, the book, when we move from there, when we look at uh, God's instructions uh, to the priests, uh, we see that you know. He talks about certain sacrifices. He saw, talks about certain uh, kinds of sacrifices, and um, uh, and all that we see in Leviticus. We see, you know, so we see all that in the Old Testament, right? So we will look at the Tabernacle of Moses uh, in in detail, uh, what it all, what it involved, etc. And and we've studied that in praise and worship, but we look at it again, right? Um, and we also read about the temple. Right, the temple where God where God gave David the design, and David gave uh, Solomon. He gave him the literally a kind of the blueprint and said, "This is how the temple should be." And Sa Solomon built it and and consecrated it, and and we see that uh, the worship part of it, aspect of it, there's a lot of emphasis on sacrifice again, sacrificial offerings, bringing an offering to God. But we also see that element of music being introduced, like right from the tabernacle of uh, that David built, and also the tabernacle uh, or the temple with Solomon. Right from the time of David, we see that whole aspect of singing and music and uh, being, um, uh, you know, being mentioned right in the Word of God. Right, and so we see that uh, um, in Second Solomon. We see the Ark of the Covenant representing the the presence of God, right? We see that uh, it was brought back. It was brought back to Jerusalem. It was with the Philippines. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. It was with the uh, uh, Philistines. It was brought back to the to Jerusalem, and then we see that there was all kinds of celebration, even as it was being brought back. And then we see that. Uh, David actually uh, giving instructions. This is how the tabernacle should be. Uh, so we call it the tabernacle of David. And then we see a lot of uh, you know spontaneous worship happening. We see uh, music happening. We see singers there, and it becomes very very organized. Like for example, if you look at uh, Second Chronicles five uh, and verse twelve. Okay, so let's uh, let's just look at that for a minute. Okay, Second Chronicles five and verse twelve. Okay, so the ark is brought in. Verse twelve: the Levites who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Haman and Jeduthun with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, and with them one hundred and twenty priests, sounding with trumpets right so so this was there how it was you know in the temple so we see that uh, uh, during that inauguration so which, which means that it has become it was actually a it was a reflection of what was there in the tabernacle as well right what we see in 
uh, First Chronicles, right? So the same thing is incorporated here. So we, we see that it has become very structured, very organized, very big, lavish, right? So we see all that uh, happening there. We also see, you know, right through the Old Testament, we see when it comes to some of these kings who brought back this temple worship, right? Who continued with this, like Hezekiah was one of them. Second Chronicles, uh, we can move to 29. Okay, chapter 29 and I think it's verse 25, right? Okay. So this is um, about King Hezekiah and how he restores the worship in the temple, right? So we then King Hezekiah rose early, verse 20, gathered the rulers of the city, went up to the house of the Lord, and it talks about what they brought for the sacrifice, right? And then in verse 25, it says, and he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with stringed instruments, with harps, according to the commandment of David, of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet. For thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded them to offer the burnt offering on the altar. And when the burnt offerings began, the song of the Lord also began with the trumpets and with the instruments of David, the king of Israel. So all the assembly worshipped, the singers sang and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had finished offering, the king and all who were present with him bowed and worshipped. Okay, so we see how they related to God, how they worshipped, right? how they communed with him. And uh, we see this, this is how it, so we see right from the time of Abraham, um, we see things unfolding, right? How people worshiped God, how people connected with him, how they communed with him, okay? So when, uh, so this was in the temple, right? And then various kings continued or reinstituted this worship in the temple and it had the same, kind of planning, he had, had the same kind of format, right? Um, now, this temple was destroyed. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and then Babylonians were taken to exile. And the people of Israel returned to Jerusalem, right? And uh, it, was, it was rebuilt. Um, and then... Uh, it was the temple, second temple. In the in the second temple, also there was worship that was reinstituted. Okay, then we read about Ezra, Nehemiah. You know, after this reinstitution or rebuilding of the temple, how they reinstituted or brought back the worship. Right. So Ezra talks about that. The book of Ezra, uh, the book of Nehemiah also talks about that. You know, we know that they were contemporaries, right? So let's look at uh, Ezra chapter 2, right? Um, Ezra 2 and uh, 41. Okay. Can somebody read it? Um, Ezra 2. If you go, yeah, with the mic, please. Sorry, mm. yeah, 41. The singers, the songs of Asab, mm. 128. Okay, so uh, can you read the just read the next 28? The sons of Getekipers, mm. the sons of Salum, the sons of Atar, the sons of. Tolmon, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatita, and the sons of Sobai. Okay. 139 in all. Right. So, um, 
so it it talks about um you know uh, if you, if you go to verse uh, sorry chapter 3 right so it talks about again you know how it was done and how they offered the uh, the sacrifices and uh, you know it talks about the restoration of the temple restoration of worship in the temple and so on right so nehemiah also uh, talks about that right how they stood up how they read and all that you know nehemiah 12 um, people were appointed over the chambers for the stores the contributions the fruits of the tithes and and so on okay so um, they performed the worship of the lord and the service of purification together with the singers and the gatekeepers uh, according you know it, this is interesting in accordance with the command of david and of his son solomon for in the days of david and asaph in ancient times there were leaders of the singers songs of praise and hymns of thanksgiving to god okay so nehemiah 12 uh, 44 onwards right so it sees it, it so it shows us that yes what was laid out what was instituted um you know uh, from the time of the tabernacle of moses what was brought back as the time uh, during the time of tabernacle of david the tabernacle that david brought in or the what we would call as a davidic form of worship that continued in the old testament and we see that that continued through those uh, you know uh, reign of these various kings and even when the temple was destroyed and it was rebuilt now we are talking about several centuries right uh, passage of time and we see that they brought back the same worship with singers you know with the priests and so on right an offering of songs of praise to god along with the sacrifices so we see that right okay and you know a couple of quotes i think it's very interesting to um, go through this martin luther uh, he says he said to have said you know next to theology i give music the highest place and honor music is the art of the prophets the only art that can calm the agitations of the soul it is one of the most magnificent and delightful presence god has given us Okay, so yes, we can talk. Uh, we can speak our prayers to God. God understands. We can speak out our praises to God, and uh, it is that that is something that we need to do. We must do. We can declare it. Uh, but also, when we when we sing, right, there is there is something that happens because it involves our spirit, soul, and body, right? And we also read that in Second Kings, we read about the fact that uh, that music stirs up the anointing that we read right when elisha when the kings uh, go there and meet elisha and elisha says bring me a musician and when the musician begins to play uh, scripture records that you know the hand of the lord came upon elisha and the prophet said he said thus says the lord so we see that this place of music this place of music in worship is is there in the old testament as well right the old testament right through okay okay so we'll stop here and then come back after the break and continue